Now, Aziza Kanji is a legal scholar and writer based in Toronto. She received her Juris Doctor from the University of Toronto Faculty of Law and LLM specializing in Islamic law from the School of Oriental and African Studies uh, in University of London. I know she participated in a number of our conferences before and we're delighted to have her back with us. And Elisa Banfi, she's currently postdoctoral research assistant for the Institute of Citizenship Studies at the University of Geneva. Uh, her work focuses on Muslim, on Muslim organizations in Europe, the engagement of religious actors, and the relationship between religion and politics. She has also been interested in the history of the non-aligned movement, the Egyptian labor movement, and the self-organization of immigrants in Italy. So I'm interested in the non-aligned non movement as well. Uh, Vista Iskandari. Uh, Vista is a Swiss lawyer who obtained her bachelor degree at the University of Geneva. She participated during her, for, uh, her formation of the first law clinic for the rights of vulnerable groups uh, and helped to elaborate a brochure for Roma people in precarious situations in Geneva. Actually, our first uh, uh, symposium, we had actually Roma people and we were discussing the similarities between Roma people and the situation of the Muslims. So this, we have definitely have intersectionality and uh, convergence. So please uh, welcome our first panel, and hopefully when our third speaker, uh, fourth speaker come, they will actually join the panel. Aziza, you're up first, so you could come and join us. You could come and speak in here or there. Yes. Come on. So I can see Ramon's lovely face from up close while I'm speaking. <laughs> Good morning, Salaam Alaikum. The title of my piece, Muslim by Law, The Legal Construction of the Racialized Terrorist in Canada, is an homage to Ian Haney Lopez's seminal study, White by Law, The Legal Construction of Race. In White by Law, Haney Lopez demonstrated, through his analysis of the prerequisite cases, which decided what qualified as white, for the purposes of naturalization to American citizenship. Through this study, he demonstrated that law is an important site where race is made. Law does not simply reflect racial formations as they already exist, but actively participates in the production of race. Haney Lopez noted that legal construction of racial difference now usually occurs by use of, quote, legal terms that do not refer explicitly to race, but nevertheless come to serve as racial synonyms. Indeed, the law's ability to provide seemingly neutral synonyms for race may be one of the most important legal mechanisms in the current processes of racial construction. Here, I examine how race is produced in Canadian criminal law through judicial decisions in terrorism prosecutions. In other words, I examine how the terrorist becomes a Muslim in law. Like whiteness, terrorism is characterized by fundamental instability in meaning. Scholars largely concur that there is no internationally agreed upon definition of terrorism, and domestic codes diverge on basic aspects of the definition of the term. In her book, Disciplining Terror, How Experts Invented Terrorism, Lisa Stamkinski charted a shift that has occurred in the way that the term terrorism is deployed. While originally conceptualized as a tactic or a tool used by possibly a wide variety of political actors, quote, as the problem of terrorism took shape, over the course of the 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, it came to be understood as rooted to a terrorist identity rather than as a tactic that any group might adopt. This led to the proposition that terrorists commit terrorism because they are terrorists. The identity contains its own explanation. Terrorists are evil, irrational actors 
whose action is driven not by normal interests or political motives, but instead by their very nature as terrorists." End quote. And I think all of us appreciate that this terrorist identity is deeply racialized in the age of the global war on terror. In Canada, the term terrorism serves in policy documents and media reports as a, to return to Haney Lopez's term, seemingly neutral synonym for violence or the threat of violence emanating from Muslims. Law is one key node in the discursive circuit that consolidates this synonymization. Terrorism was defined in Canadian law for the first time in post 9-11 amendments to the criminal code as serious violence to people or property, quote, that is committed in whole or in part for a political, religious, or ideological purpose with the intention of intimidating the public or a segment of the public with regard to its security or compelling a person, a government, or a domestic or an international organization to do or refrain from doing any act. And it counts as terrorism no matter where in the world that it occurs. A wide range of actions only remotely related to actual violence are criminalized in Canadian law as terrorism offenses, including entering or remaining in any country for the benefit of, at the direction of, or in association with a terrorist group, leaving or attempting to leave Canada to participate in the activity of a terrorist group or to facilitate terrorist activity, providing, collecting, or making available property or services for terrorist purposes, and in the most recent iteration of Canadian anti-terrorism law, the promotion or advocacy of terrorism offenses in general is also criminalized. And so we can see that the notion of terrorism offense in the Canadian criminal, law, criminal code is expansive and vaguely delineated and defined by the presence of a particular terroristic, political, religious, or ideological motive a requirement that may look neutral with respect to race and religion on its face, but which is actually deeply racialized in application. The apparently extremely wide scope of terrorism offenses in Canadian law is effectively restricted by implicit racial ideas about whose violence constitutes terrorism and what types of motives constitute terrorist motives. By the never explicitly articulated, at least in law, but still pervasive common sense that the paradigmatic terrorist is a Muslim driven by so-called Islamic extremism. In Canada, there have been 26 completed terrorism prosecutions under the post 9-11 law, with a 95% conviction rate for cases brought to trial and all but one of these cases have involved Muslims or individuals linked to Muslim groups. The almost exclusively Muslim focus of terrorism prosecutions does not reflect the actual spectrum of violence linked to different political or ideological groups in Canada. Since 2001, more people have been killed in far right-wing and white supremacist attacks, at least five, than have been killed in Muslim attacks. Too. But, the white, uh, but the white supremacist and far right wing incidents have been charged under non terrorism sections of the criminal code. In an interview with the Montreal Gazette, law professor Craig Forsays, who is a well known critical voice on matters of national security, opines that this difference, quote, does not necessarily indicate that there is structural racism, but violence by white supremacists can be easier to prove as assaults than trying to prove complicated elements of terrorism. And he's referring here particularly to the political, religious, or ideological motive element. And this professor, uh, for context, for those of you who I'm sure aren't familiar with the Canadian scene of national security critique, is one of the foremost critical voices in national security. When our 2015 extremely draconian um, anti-terrorism law was passed, he and another professor, uh, Kent Roach, were the foremost voices uh, explaining why this law was problematic. And yet, the racial construction that enables draconian terrorism laws is not questioned. 
So Craig Forsyth says there is no systemic racism here. But the very fact that Muslim-linked violence is prosecuted as terrorism, while non-Muslim ideological and political violence is being prosecuted as non-terrorism, as assault or as murder, indicates that Muslim lives are being criminalized here in ways that other lives are not. Terrorism is represented as a unique threat to Canadian society. As retired Justice John Major declared in his report on the Air India bombing, quote, terrorism is an existential threat to Canadian society in a way that murder, assault, robbery, and other crimes are not. Terrorists reject and challenge the very foundations of Canadian society, end quote. The supposedly existentially threatening nature of terrorism is cited to justify the introduction of a wide range of uh, measures supposedly aimed at preventing terrorist violence before it occurs, rather than simply punishing it afterwards. And we see there's across the spectrum from the criminal to the pre-criminal to the quasi-criminal to the outright illegal uh, tactics such as uh, preemptive rendition and torture people thought to be terrorist threats. In the criminal law, this takes the form, as we saw, of the criminalization of a broad swath of actions only tangentially connected to violence, remaining in the country to commit a terrorist threat, for example. And so it is revealing, highly revealing, that white supremacists and far right wing actors tend to be charged for assault or murder, violence already completed while the more preemptive terrorism sections of the criminal code are largely reserved for Muslims to punish intentions and incipient preparations for violence. In other words, Muslim lives are being subject to preventive criminalization in ways that other lives are not. And this asserted uniqueness of terrorism is expressed in a very self-consciously and unusually harsh approach uh, to punishment at all stages of the legal process, from the imposition of a, of a reverse onus to obtaining pretrial bail to um, increased requirements before one is eligible for parole. So across the spectrum of the legal process. The terrorist is marked as a different, more radically dangerous species than the perpetrators of other types of violent crime. This terrorist difference is articulated in judicial reasoning through several intertwined themes, all underpinned by the racial construction of the terrorist as a Muslim. Uh, so first, terrorism is anti-Canadian and anti-civilization. In the Queen and Khalid, for instance, Justice Derno of the Ontario Superior Court stated that terrorist offenses are, quote, the most vile form of criminal conduct. They attack the very fabric of Canada's democratic ideals their motivation is unique and fundamentally at odds with the rule of law. And in The Queen and Gaia, Justice Hill of the same court proclaimed that, quote, the evil of terrorism is anathema in civilized societies committed to the rule of law, where it is freedom of expression and democratic processes which advance public debate relating to political, religious, economic, and social issues. Almost all of the terrorism sentencing decisions contain language in this vein. Violence terrorism is projected as something external to Canadian values and society, originating with Muslim others who come from outside the state's borders of geography or identity. This projection obscures Canada's own foundational structures of violence. Perhaps most importantly, the white supremacy which undergirds the settler colonial state and which is what makes it so difficult to identify white supremacist violence as also being terrorism. The second theme, the terrorist extremist embodies an exceptional psychology. And because of this, the tests normally used to assess the risk of recidivism and potential for rehabilitation are deemed inapplicable to terrorists because terrorists unlike other offenders, apparently do not engage in violence because of some psychological issue, but rather because they are infected by radical religious ideology. In the Queen and Ahmed, a special assessment and treatment of radicalization scale was administered. 
Despite the superficially race and religion neutral name of the scale, it refers to radicalization in general, its Muslim-specific formulation is evident from the six dimensions measured. Negative attitudes towards Israel, political views that are advocated by Middle Eastern extremists such as opposing secular laws and governments and advocating the implementation of Sharia law, attitudes towards women, negative attitudes towards Western culture, religiosity, and six, condoning fighting, which measures views that promote acts of violence as a means for the revival of religion with the goal of destroying infidels and achieving one world under the Islamic religion. So these are the aspects of the exceptional terrorist psychology that are thought to make the terrorist a unique type of violent um, actor in society. And because of these two previous themes, the fact that the terrorist is psychologically exceptional and um, that the psychologist is fun or that the terrorist is fundamentally anti-Canadian and anti-civilization, the terrorist also becomes an object of war. The terrorist is portrayed not only as a criminal, but also as an enemy with whom the state is at war. However, unlike in a traditional war, in which fighters on both sides are entitled to use violence against fellow combatants under international humanitarian law, any violence used by the terrorist enemy is considered inherently illegitimate and illegal, even if aimed at the soldiers of an occupying force. This is reminiscent of colonial discourses, which asserted that the violence of colonized peoples was inherently illegitimate and illegal in international humanitarian law because of their supposed savagery. In this logic, it is not only terrorist killing of civilians that is considered reprehensible. Targeting of soldiers is equally castigated as terrorism. And so even though in Canadian uh, terrorism law there is an exception for violence that is committed in accordance with international humanitarian law, meaning that the fact that someone was only targeting soldiers is extremely relevant to, to determining whether something qualifies as terrorism or not, this type of argument has found no traction in Canadian courts. In the Queen of Kawaja, for example, the Ontario Court of Appeal responded to Moment Kawaja's defense that his goal was to kill Western soldiers in Afghanistan, not civilians. They uh, rejected this defense uh, by, quote, rejecting outright the notion that the lives of soldiers serving in Afghanistan should be somehow treated as less worthy of protection than the lives of um, civilians. We can see the work that um, racial logic is doing in these terrorism cases by comparing them to, pro uh, to prosecutions and sentencing decisions in cases involving non-Muslims who committed acts of violence that might otherwise be called terrorism if they were committed by a Muslim. In 2014, for example, um, Justin Bork went on a targeted killing spree against the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, um, who for those, again, who are familiar with Canada, is Canada's federal policing force. And he killed three and injured two in this shooting spree. In the sentencing decision, however, Justin Bork is never called a terrorist. Uh, he was charged with murder and attempted murder and sentenced to life. While the judge uh, did call his acts heinous and um, horrific and acknowledged that they did, in fact, terrorize the community, the label of the terrorist is never applied to Bork. Even though Bork's own lawyer described him as being immersed in, quote, right-wing Ghana culture, the role that Bork's ideology might have played in his violence is given minimal attention. Instead, far more attention is paid to the heavy metal rock bands he liked and the fact that he played video games and that he, was, um, he wasn't very secure in his interactions with women. And so, while Bork is represented um, Bork ends up being represented as an insider of the Canadian state gone horribly astray, rather than an enemy outsider who needs to be punished and cast out, in stark contrast to the lost phantasm of the radical Muslim terrorist. Thank you.
article, our aim is to explain and analyze by a post-colonial approach the legislative process that led to the institutionalization of Islamophobia in Switzerland through the case of the minarets and the Bukhaban. We argue that the institutionalization of Islamophobia is strictly related to a process of cross-fertilization across concepts of race, nation, and gender. We also analyze the historical role of the actors of such initiatives. At the time the minaret ban initiative in 2009, only four minaret stood in Switzerland. Concerning the burqa, the situation was similar. The Federal Council, which is the executive power of Switzerland, estimated some 50 to 100 cases of women using a burqa. In 2014, Muslim residents in Switzerland came to account for 5% of the Swiss population. The fear of Muslims and Islam took on a significant role in the country after the 9-11. The event of this day seriously affected the social representation of the Muslim segment of the Swiss population. Since then, the Muslim people's inability to fit in with the Swiss way of life is used as a political and legal argument. In the past, two historical moments structured the conceptual passage from Swiss racism to Swiss Islamophobia. Public debates on slavery and the debate on the apartheid in South Africa. In fact, the Swiss anti-slavery movement structured its campaign on anti-Islamic arguments. Arabs and Muslims were presented in the public opinion as being primarily responsible for slavery in Africa. Anti-slavery activists counterposed the representation of polygamists and morally depraved Arabs and Muslim slave drivers to the ideal archetype of white Christian saving poor and uncivilized black people. Then, in 1982, a pro-apartheid group in Switzerland played a relevant role in the conceptualization of race in Switzerland. In fact, the Arbeitsgruppe Südliches Afrika supporting the South African apartheid was meeting in Egerkingen, in the canton of Soler in Switzerland. Its founding president was Christoph Blocher, who is now a charismatic leader of the Swiss People's Party in Switzerland, the party that promoted the ban on minaret and the burqa in the last two decades. Another member of this group is Ulrich Schluer, which is one of the most influential members of the Eger King and Committee, which is the same committee that launched the ban on minaret and the burqa ban in 2016. We based our analysis on studies analyzing the colonial roots of racialization of Muslims and the gendered Islamophobia by a post-colonial and intersectional approach. Our analysis relies on the last 10 years of federal and cantonal parliamentarian requests, motion, postulate, and interpolations concerning minarets and the burqa from 2006 to 2016. In the first step, we selected the request, motion, postulate, and interpolation by members of federal assembly on this issue before, during, and after the political campaign on federal constitutional initiative concerning minaret and burqa. In the second step, working with a pool of all evoked arguments, we sampled those referring to neo-orientalist representation of Islam and Muslims. The Federal Council and Assembly, the executive power and the legislative power of Switzerland, gradually mobilized neo-orientalist arguments concerning Muslim women. In 2006, Darbele was the first politician uh, he's a Christian Democratic in the Christian Democratic People's Party, making an interpolation to the Federal Council in order to address the issue of the burqa ban. Neo-Orientalist arguments were yet not explicit. His reasoning was mainly based on the necessary convergence between Swiss laws and European ones. His purpose was to push the executive power of Switzerland to legislate on this topic. The executive power of Switzerland did not take any action then. In a second intervention in 2009, Darbele addressed the larger issue of wearing the burqa niqab by defining more is explicitly this behavior as incompatible with proper integration and the fundamental rights of, human right, of women. 
In the answer to this interpretation, the Federal Council rejected the proposition of a general burqa ban, but orientalist thematic of the Western gaze imposing a visual control on inferior dominated population emerged in its argumentation. Beginning in 2007, a group of 16 extreme right-wing politicians from the Swiss People's Party, commonly called the Eger Kingdom Committee, proposed to amend the Swiss constitution by adding a general ban on minaret through the popular vote. During the campaign, the committee mobilized different Islamophobic arguments to convince Swiss people to vote in favor of the ban. The committee explained its pro propaganda poster, which you saw before, by saying that minarets were not a religious symbol, but a political one and by stating that the minaret is the sign of a territory conquered by Islam where the divine law applies. Sharia, Sharia law deprives women of their liberty. The burqa is its symbol. The Swiss People's Party discourse on Muslim women shaped the campaign leading to the acceptation on the minaret ban. This would mark the beginning of the institutionalization of Islamophobia in Switzerland. The federal ban on minaret allowed to reopen the debate on the burqa ban. In fact, in 2011, a group of citizens of the canton of Ticino proposed a cantonal initiative prohibiting the concealing of one's face. All neo-orientalist arguments were used during the campaign, educating and saving Muslims from their inferiority, saving Muslim women from violent Muslim men, and symbolically extending the civilizing mission beyond the Swiss borders. On September 2013, the citizens of the canton of Ticino accepted the initiative by 65.4%. On November 2014, the Federal Council stated that the new article of the Ticinese Constitution on face covering was in conformity with the rights guaranteed by the Swiss Constitution. The success of the Ticinese Cantonal Initiative stimulated two different legislative procedures. First, in December 2014, a parliamentary initiative modifying the federal constitution. This would add a new paragraph in the Swiss constitution on the, uh, the ban on face covering for the reason of sex. Second, the launch by the Eger King and Committee in March 2016, of the initiative Yes to the Ban of Concealing One's Face. This means that in 2017 or 2018, the Swiss constitution will probably again be modified by a popular vote to ban a symbol which non-Muslims have assigned as representing Islam in the public space. This ban will symbolize the possibility of playing with neo-orientalist and colonial representation of Islam in order to dissociate Muslims from the national body and associate them with a dangerous alien group. This way, the institutionalization of Islamophobia will reach its climax in Switzerland. Our an analysis of the institutionalization of Islamophobia in Switzerland between 2006 and 2016 highlights a process of racialization of Muslim groups that occurred via the instrument of direct democracy, especially popular federal initiative. Both initiatives concerning minaret and the burqa ban have focused on alleged symbols of Islamic religious practices while avoiding any theological debates. The political parties and the initiative committees have articulated their argument by reintroducing colonial stereotypes, such as the danger of an Islamic invasion or the moral deprivation and inferiority of Arabs' Muslim treatment of women. This way, the fear of Islamic aggression in the Helvetic territory is symbolically inter intertwined with the oppression of Muslim women wearing the burqa. Muslim women and Muslim men are represented as belonging to an inferior human group whose religion is an obstacle to their evolution toward the civilized humankind of Helvetia. Both constitutional in a popular initiative cons contributed 
to build an ontological distance between us and them that reactivated the legacy of colonial racial hierarchies by dissimulating them by the way of religious differences. The Muslim category is, defined, is definitely racialized by paving the way for an institutionalization of Islamophobia in cantonal and federal constitutions. The detailed analysis of this process has displayed how gendered identities were used to legitimize racialized categories produced by the alleged national homogenous community to define the alien group of Muslims. First, the institutionalization of Islamophobia in Switzerland was realized via the Constitutional Popular Initiative on the ban on minarets. The symbol of the minarets was associated with the image of oppressed Muslim women as a justification for this legislative act. This image objectified and stressed the supposed inferiority of Muslim women. The ban on minaret targeted all Muslims by affirming their incompatibility with the national corpus. The ban introduced juridical arguments that mobilized the category of dangerous and uncivilized Muslim in the de legislative debate. The second step of the institutionalization of Islamophobia in Switzerland related to the burqa ban which targeted the subgroup of Muslim women. The promoter of the burqa ban and the minaret ban was the Egil Kingen Committee. Many members of this committee supported the apartheid regime in South Africa and militated against Swiss women's right to vote and to be considered equal to men in regard to, in regard to matrimonial law. This, commitment, this committee chose the burqa as a symbol that essentialized the Islamic oppression of women. The burqa is a symbol externally assigned to women, to Muslims, by non-Muslim actors in, in order to create distance between two alleged poles of civilization and to reinforce the idea of the superiority of Western civilization over Islamic civilization. The symbol of the burqa targets Muslim women, the most visible part of the racialized group, who wear the hijab in public spaces. The symbol of the burqa dehumanizes Muslim women twice. On the one hand, for their belonging to an uncivilized community, and on the other hand, for their inability to emancipate themselves without being saved by Western actors. The ban on the burqa offers a unique solution to Muslim women to be accepted in the national community, to be saved by Swiss authorities and laws. However, they will be integrated into the Swiss society only if they recognize their inferiority of their condition and the uncivilized nature of their Islamic community. They can whiten themselves only by recognizing the savagery of their group, of their group of origin. From cultural whitening to a racial one, the borders are blurring. In fact, Muslim women can become part of the Swiss race only by accepting their inferiority. They can voice themselves only by outlining the superiority of Swiss values in respect to Muslim ones. At this time, it is clear that the Burqa ban enacted in the canton of Ticino paved the way for other laws targeting the veil in general as a symbol of incompatibility based on the model of the French law.
the institutional situation of uh, Islamophobia in Switzerland um, was operationalized by the use of the direct instrument that is the popular initiative at the federal and cantonal level. In the second step, we have the federal initiative instrument, popular initiative, concerning minarets. In the third, we, we shift and we use the cantonal popular initiative because in Switzerland we, we can uh, change the constitutional law at the federal level and at the cantonal level. We have 26 cantons in Switzerland, and each canton has a cantonal uh, a, 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 a constitution. So why the news that in the Ticino, the Ticino, the, the change of the Ticino constitution to obtain the launching at the federal level of the Burka ban? Because in the first time, uh, the launch at the federal level of the Burka ban was um, uh, obstaculated by the federal council, the executive power at the federal level. For that reason, the committee of the Kingen uh, tried to use the cantonal popular initiative in the Ticino that is very, mm, the canton of Ticino is the, have uh, two parties, the right, the Swiss party, people party, and also the Lega Ticinese. So it's very favorable uh, canton to launch this kind of ban. And for that reason, the use, uh, and it's uh, explicitly at the beginning of the Burka Canton, uh, Burka uh, Initiative in Ticino, the, orga, the, the committee that organized this cantonal uh, initiative in Ticino explicitly said that the, the uh, aim is to obtain the grant of conformity at the federal level to after launching the federal initiative. Why? Because when you modify the cantonal constitution, after that, you have to obtain uh, a legitimation from the federal level that this modification is not against human rights. For that reason, they obtain this conformity because it's very difficult that the federal level obstacle the, this kind of process in order to respect the autonomy. And after that, they use this argument of conformity to launch at the federal level the Burka initiative. The, why uh, the Swiss semi-direct democracy? Because in Switzerland, you can, uh, the Swiss constitution permits you, you have to collect um, 100,000 signatures to be able to make a popular initiative in order to modify the Swiss constitution, which means that uh, the, mina the minaret ban was they had to collect 100,000 signatures to be able to submit it to the vote of the people. So why direct democracy helped the institutionalization of Islamophobia? Because Swiss people voted in favor of the minaret ban to change the constitution. The federal system of Switzerland has the particularity of initiative can be launched by uh, private persons, as it was done for the minaret ban. There were politicians, but it was a private initiative. But it can also be launched by the parliament, by the parliament, the Swiss parliament. For the Burka ban, what we can analyze is that the parliament, some people in the parliament have tried since 2006 to launch a law against the burqa, they weren't successful. So now they are launching a private, it's the same people, but they are doing a private initiative to achieve their goal. And Swiss people will have to vote, um, probably in 2018, in favor or against the burqa ban. So that's how you can use direct democracy as an instrument. Any other questions? Uh, for the first speaker, uh, is there any similarity that you see uh, between the US and the Canadian case in terms of using, maybe in, Can in Canada, using the provisional uh, legislation side 
dead level rather than a better level of uh, normalizing Islamophobic subject or amendment to constitution or ruling of a lawyer. So in the United States, it's very hard to pass. Uh, mm -hmm. The group, most of the group targets the state level to make constitutional amendments, just like the Swiss uh, probably case, because it's very hard to do it in a federal level. Uh, isn't the Canadian example is that similarity like that, or is it the operate different? So in Canada, there haven't been anything like any type of constitutional amendment or anything to institutionalize Islamophobia. The way that it's occurred primarily in law is through uh, judges' interpretation of laws, which are neutral on the face of them, but extremely discriminatory in application. The Canadian anti-terrorism law has built in a space for this racialization to, act, to occur because the definition of terrorism includes a requirement for a political, religious, or ideological motive, which has been applied mainly to criminalize Muslim motives for terrorism. In the, in the American um, terrorism law, to my knowledge, there is no motive requirement, but it seems, um, from my uh, very superficial understanding of it, that in the same way, the primarily more preemptive or um, more removed from violence sections like material support have primarily been applied against Muslims, whereas um, when um, other types of violence have been characterized as terrorism, it's when violence has actually occurred, not for things that are preparatory to violence. So I think that there's a similar similarity there in the way at a federal level, the laws are being applied in Canada and the US, which in a way shows how the notion of terrorism is already overdetermined to be Muslim, that it doesn't matter whether explicitly there is this um, motive requirements susceptible to racialized interpretation because the common sense understanding that the paradigmatic terrorist is a Muslim is so powerful on both sides of the border that it effectively restricts the interpretation of who is a terrorist regardless of the textual um, definition of terrorism in both cases. And so I know in the US there also have been several uh, state level initiatives, I think regarding to property laws and things like that, building of, building of mosques. Um, but when it comes to terrorism cases, those are at a federal level, usually in both Canada and the US. And I think we see a similar way that the laws are being applied in both states. Just wanted to ask if there is, a, for example, in the case of Canada, a, compared to Switzerland, like extreme right parties emerging or with force, or maybe they're too marginal and they don't have any impact. I mean, how does it work in relation to the two countries uh, on this question? Of course, in France, the Front National is big and probably will win the first round of the elections in May. Uh, Trump just you know, won the election, whatever uh, the difference in the popular vote, but won the elections in the USA. And you know the Brexit happened, you know, uh, the Minaret vote was won. So my question is, are there, uh, to, to all of you, uh, like string right parties instrumentalizing Islam for all this stuff, and how much force they have in the society? Okay. Uh, so the party that was in power before the 2015 election of Justin Trudeau's Liberals, uh, the Conservative Party run by Stephen Harper, was considered extreme right in the context of Canada. And there we saw for many years a very explicit deployment of Islamophobic ideas. Um, some say that it was cynical um, in, in the favor of, of um, political uh, mobilization, but I think it actually runs uh, deeper than that. Um, so in um, 2010, the government had imposed, not through law, but through passage of a regulation, a ban on women uh, wearing face coverings from taking the citizenship oath, essentially barring women who wear niqab from uh, becoming citizens. We also saw the passage of the Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act, uh, which again, seems to be neutrally talking about all the barbarians out there, but was really focused on uh, forms of violence against women uh, that are popularly associated with Muslim communities, uh, forced marriage, polygamy, quote unquote, honor killing. Uh, so those would have been considered extreme right in Canada uh, before Stephen Harper came into power, but uh, during his rule, those types of Islamophobic discourse really became normalized 
And so now with the election of Justin Trudeau, which is uh, hailed as uh, sort of a, a reemergence of Canada as this mythical haven of multicultural tolerance, but Trudeau's liberals also supported the Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices Act. They also supported uh, Bill C-51, the 2015 Anti-Terrorism Act, which is an extremely draconian piece of anti-terrorism law, which on the backs of the figure of these uh, demonic Muslim radical terrorists um, does things like criminalize extremely vague speech offenses like advocacy or promotion of terrorism offenses in general. And so that type of Islamophobia, which I think before would have been considered to be more extreme, has become normalized. And in the meantime, that's created more space for expressions of even more um, extreme Islamophobia in mainstream political discourse. The Conservative Party is currently having a, um, uh, they're selecting their next uh, leader of the party, and one of the front runners, Kelly Leach, uh, was very happy about the election of Donald Trump in the US, and she said things like, you know, we need to bring this um, to Canada, and it shows that he's, he's speaking to, gen to genuine populist concerns in the country. She also proposed making um, uh, would-be immigrants to Canada take a Canadian values test to ensure that they're in accordance with Canadian values, and of course by that she doesn't mean genocide of indigenous people, she means saving Muslim women from barbaric uh, Muslim men. And, and so when you ask about whether there's a far right in Canada, I think part of the problem is that our definition of what's right and far right has so far shifted by the centralization and normalization of Islamophobia um, that it's really become a, a shifting scale that's been pulled um, towards extreme Islamophobic discourse, which is now considered normal. So in Switzerland, the, the Minaret ban and the Burka ban was launched by the far wing, uh, right wing party, Swiss People's Party, which is a far right wing party. And since a couple of years, uh, every initiative that they have launched has been successful. Like, like the, um, they launched an initiative against mass immigration, which was successful. And now Switzerland has to deal with the European uh, bilateral um, uh, deals to see how they are going to apply this law uh, because of quotas that have to be in, uh, in, in installed in Swiss law. And for example, another law that was voted uh, was to change the constitution again, was uh, to export automatically export uh, foreign criminals, deport foreign criminals so the, the Swiss People's Party is quite powerful in Switzerland and is almost every time successful when it launches an initiative. In Switzerland, the difference is that the Swiss People's Party is, a, is a, it, the main party for the right. It's very powerful and um, the Islamic focus is integrated in, in, uh, in its agenda, its political agenda. Uh, in a very complex way because it's a, in, it interacts with also the migratory initiative, popular initiative, and also the other kind of uh, initiative against women. Because this party uh, is the nature of this party is also against immigrants and against women. And until now, we have uh, some initiative against the Office of Equality in Switzerland mm -hmm. uh, in 2008 that the Swiss Party launched against the possibility to have an Office of Equality at the Canton level in Basel, for instance. So it, it's very difficult to understand, but Islam was very important to the Swiss Republic Party to widen the historical part, the historical past of this party that was supporting apartheid and against the women's rights. So it's strategic to uh, to change the idea that these parties are, are is acting against already against till now against the women rights, the Swiss women rights. Um, I, excuse me if I'm simplifying both uh, arguments down, um, but it seems that there's a, an implication on both that um, Islamophobia is emanating from slightly. Um, the, the, the first speaker you spoke about how um, the legal structures of the state um, are producing anti-homophobic discourse, or, or these implications of 
within a set of colonial context. Um, whereas the, the second speaker who spoke about how it's actually the status, the democratic structures of the state are being co-opted as opposed to actually producing it themselves. I was wondering whether there's any way of sort of reconciling those differences between saying that it's the, the, the legal structure of the state is creating it versus the structure of the state is being co-opted by an outside group and whether you feel there's any way of bringing those two together. Well, um, I think that uh, our case is different because in Switzerland you can uh, change the constitution by the popular initiative. So it's not a, a case in other states. For that reason, we have maybe this kind of cooperation because it's, uh, it's possible to do this. I don't know if in Canada you can uh, use the popular initiative to introduce the homophobic element in the law. Well, I think in Canada there's no need to use the popular element to introduce it because I think a certain amount of, uh, or the need to project that kind of terrorist violence onto Muslim others is built, as you said, into the settler colonial structure of the state. And so we really have to understand how the discourse of terrorism has been um, applied in Canada to project violence onto Muslim outsiders as well as to demonize the resistance of indigenous peoples towards settler colonialism. So when terrorism, or the idea of terrorism, becomes um, institutionalized in Canada as a threat and um, modes of control are institutionalized uh, that are justified as necessary to deal with Muslim terrorism, the state also tends to turn those against indigenous activists. We know that indigenous activists, uh, it was recently revealed uh, that the state had a list of so many indigenous activists that it was also monitoring under laws that were originally justified to suppress the Muslim terrorist threat. Um, and so it's not really a question of co-optation so much as the differential racialization of Muslims as an external threat and indigenous peoples as an internal threat who are unentitled to sovereignty to um, maintain uh, their, their dispossession, which enables the perpetuation of the Canadian state, that the relationship between those two modes of racialization are actually uh, constitutive of the structure of the Canadian state, and terrorism discourse is one manifestation of that. discourse outside the judicial realm is certainly important also in consolidating the identification of terrorism with Islamic extremism. Uh, Public Safety Canada, which is the uh, a government body that was developed post 9-11 to be in charge of various different uh, safety threats to Canadians, has been for the past few years releasing a threat on the uh, domestic terror, a report on the domestic terrorist threats. 
to Canada, and in it, it's entirely about Muslims. And so it's never explicitly said when we're talking about terrorism, we're only talking about Muslims, but de facto it ends up being entirely a discussion about Muslim um, terrorists, and it's framed in a, very, in a transnational way, so it doesn't matter whether they're here or whether they're there, you know, whether they're in Somalia or Afghanistan or, or Iraq, it doesn't matter where they are, wherever they are, they're a threat to Canadian um, safety. Earlier iterations of the report indicated that the government should also be worried about, and they said this in one sentence, uh, white supremacist, extreme right-wing, anti-capitalist, and environmental extremism. They put that one sentence in there, but that sentence very quickly disappeared in um, subsequent iterations of these Public Safety Canada reports, including the most recent one that was issued under the Trudeau government, which is often represented as a departure from the national security policies of the previous Harper regime. Um, but importantly, we see a, um, a circulation of terrorism discourse between the law courts and these policy reports because the policy reports also make note of the terrorism prosecutions that have occurred in Canada, referring back to the same um, cases, the Toronto 18, and, and um, had a couple of quotes from those sentencing decisions, um, the Via Rail um, terrorist attack. Both of these were thwarted attacks, which didn't actually result in any violence. In both cases, there was also very heavy involvement by government informants, without which the plans might not have got to the stage where they could have been prosecuted. But none of this is mentioned in the reports. Also not mentioned in the reports are cases like the Justin Fork case, the uh, man who went on a shooting spree against federal police officers. So because of the identification of terrorism with Muslims in the court cases, then that also um, circulates into the way that it's talked about in the policy documents. As for uh, what can we do beyond critique, I think that what this makes clear is that terrorism doesn't really have any cogency or coherence or integrity as a legal term without the implicit racialization, which is what makes it make sense. Um, and so I think by revealing that, it provides stronger ground for critiquing the, the introduction of anti-terrorism measures in law because law pretends that it's not just being political, that it's not just castigating certain forms of violence that it's politically opposed to, um, which is why you need to use these neutral terms. But once you dig deeper and uncover, uncover the racial discourse, which makes the terms make sense in the first place, I think that that bifurcation of the legal and the political very quickly disappears. Question about the shift to try to identify Islam or Muslim community as a relation to being a political ideology rather than a religion. And therefore, what is the implication in terms of the law, in terms of the Swiss, Swiss case, and how does the state move in that direction? Because we're seeing similar type of discourse in the US, and more so as we get into the new administration. Uh, so in the, in the Swiss case, we can see that this argument is one of the main arguments for the Minaret ban and the Burka ban, and it is uh, an argument to be able to pass uh, the human rights mm -hmm. because really uh, freedom of religion is protected by human rights. So if you say this is not religion, this is political, mm -hmm. you can in a way uh, pass the human rights. So that's why this argument is used so much by the right uh, wing party that wants to launch this initiative. And this is how they managed it also. Mm -hmm. In the terrorism cases, there's definitely a massive conflation of Islam as political ideology, or these people as being these terrorists, as being motivated by political ideology, as well as being religiously extreme. So many of the cases will start by indicating that um, they do have political grievances, that the, that, uh, the people in question are upset about uh, violence in Afghanistan, for example, but then the discussion very quickly shifts to uh, analyzing 
how they are motivated to violence because they've been infected with some kind of religious extremism. And so in the cases, they're constantly invoking uh, terms which identify these terrorist forms of violence as Muslim-inspired forms of violence. They constantly say jihad, 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 or shura, shura, shura. You know, it's not enough to just say it once and then, and then use a the translation because uh, there's really an effort to frame this as a religiously extreme form of violence. And I think this is because if one were to truly grapple with the political nature of the violence, there perhaps might be a need to acknowledge that the political grievance, the underlying political grievances are legitimate and real. And perhaps some forms of what's called terrorist violence could actually fit into um, legitimate violence according to international humanitarian law. But because there's a reluctance to, uh, to acknowledge any legitimate political grievance uh, on the part of the judges, there, it very quickly has to be reframed as violence that's motivated by some kind of irrational Muslim ideology. The Burka Rana in Twitter is very important, this kind of um, mixed political and religious uh, reason, because uh, the slogan of the campaign at the cantonal level and at federal level is no free human being conceal his face. Mm -hmm. And the modification of the Constitution in space of three are an article with two, three paragraphs. One paragraph is concerning people concealing face for political reasons, violent reasons, mm -hmm. the other for the six, sex reasons. And uh, the visual campaign associated, at the, especially at the federal level, a, a woman wearing burqa with a man wearing a balaclava and launching something similar to a Molotov cocktail. So there is an association of this, uh, this image of religion with the burqa mm -hmm. and the violence of terrorism. So it's, it's made by two ways, visual campaign and the centralization structure of the article. Now, was there any case of violence from burqa wearing women in Switzerland? No, <laughs> there is 50, maybe, there are no statistics, official statistics, the Federal Council told one, ta one time in a, in a debate that there is maybe 50, maybe 100, but... Um, women who wear burqa. Wearing burqa, so it's very... Uh, just to, to be clear about it, I have project to ban the, the ban of the burqa in Switzerland, which was rejected by the political class. So my point is, isn't that, isn't that like um, inconsistent to have like in a way a really uh, Islamophobic discourse and speeches uh, coming from politicians and at the same time rejecting the law um, which was supposed to banish the veil, the uh, concerning uh, face veil from the public space? Okay. It's very important, this point, because in the article we explain all the process, okay. and it's very complicated, because there is a, a negotiation between the Assen Federal Assembly and the Federal Council. Mm -hmm. And the Federal Council rejected uh, three, three times, four mm -hmm. times, the interpolation of the motion. But if you will see inside the, the rejection, the argument of the rejection of the Federal Council, we can find progressively mobilized that the Federal Council mobilized the neo orientalist argument. So we can observe an increasing integration in the discourse of rejection of the Federal Council of the argument of the Swiss political party. And this is very irrelevant in this phase because now we have the Federal Assembly that the, the national, the state council, that is the canton part of the Federal Assembly, uh, assembly reject the initiative uh, of ban minaret, the legislative ban. But the national council accept to wait the results of the popular initiative in order maybe to compose, to gather, to, to do a law by uh, where we listen the popular wish and they compose. It's a very problematic because there is an answer and legislative initi initiative at the Federal Assembly. At the same time, there is a popular initiative. So the Federal Assembly is very, there is a pressure made by the Swiss political party through the popular initiative to co-update the Federal Assembly to make, to legislate concerning Burka. 
For that reason, it's very complicated because at the same time, we observe in the, in the historical developing is the Federal Council at the beginning was rejecting, but he, he integrates the, their argument, the neo-Rentalist argument in the rejection. It's very complicated. At the same time, for the institutional situation, the legislative situation, now it's very chaotic because we have the, the legislative in, initiative and at the same the popular initiative on the same subject. And so there is an obsession about this kind of uh, yeah, but we can still see the difference between the French situation and the Switzerland situation. There was there was no conflict uh, or oh, no resistance in France. That was unanimous. Everyone, every single politician in our national assembly voted or just like make a, a abstention. But the fact there was a consensus between mm. the political class to adopt this banishment of the. Uh, yes, it's a yeah. difference, but the Federal Assembly, at the Federal Council at the beginning, when they rejected the motion or the interpretation concerning Burka, used the reason, the legal reason, the competence about this subject is the cantonal competence, not the federal one. So the main legislative uh, argument was not to know we are not uh, pro Burka ban, but the competence is the cantonal level for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of law. So it was, of, of course, it's different from French, but the Federal Council also uh, states that there, there is a difference between them and us, so our, we have to defend our civilization, so there is, there is not the same position on the Swiss party, but it's not very, very different in terms of ontological uh, conception of, uh, of the difference between the two groups, so supposed group. Last question, is that a counter uh, movement that is pushing back against both the legal, the legal situation in Canada and Switzerland? Mm -hmm. Like which groups are coalescing to try to counter what is taking place or is it basically the communities that are affected, targeted, left alone? Our analysis for the Burka ban, for example, is that even uh, what we think is that even the Muslim community will vote in favor of the ban. Mm. Okay. And, uh, and this is part of our conclusion for the cultural whitening uh, mm. to be accepted in the dominant group. And um, I personally don't see any counter force in Switzerland, mm. uh, no for the Minaret or the Burka ban. I don't see any counter. The gender issue was crucial to con convince also the left actor mm. to support and to uh, forget the nature of the political actor launching no. a yes. communist party. Yes. Unfortunately, it's the same in Canada. There isn't really any strong counter movement, including from the Muslim community, which has largely internalized the uh, idea that there is a serious radical terrorist threat emanating from the Muslim community and that it's the responsibility of the Muslim community um, to quell this threat, which is why currently um, Canada is in the process of developing its own counter-radicalization, countering violent extremism program, and the Muslim community has very much largely been on board with these projects, uh, with the Council of Imams in Toronto saying that they're going to be opening three counter-radicalization clinics uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, part of the problem, I think, is that in the US context, there are statistics about political and ideological violence that permit the contestation of the idea that Muslims have a monopoly on what's called terrorism. In Canada, the government does not release any such statistics, and so it makes uh, it, it makes that um, Islamophobic scaffold so much harder to attack. Independent researchers are producing data on this, but they haven't received much of it, much of an ear in the Muslim community so far. Um, and when it comes to uh, national security experts who criticize these uh, draconian measures in counterterrorism, again, they primarily focus on the supposed overreach of these measures to also target people who really shouldn't be targeted, like environmental activists or indigenous activists. 
but the underlying idea that permits all of these laws to come into existence, i.e. that there is a threat of radical Islam that the state needs to counter with these very um, harsh laws and other types of policies, that underlying racial construction is never really, um, is never really challenged at all. Thank you. Thank you. Great papers.